us in that. Uh, it's always good to learn some, some new songs. I want to invite you to turn again um, today to the book of Exodus. Uh, we are in chapter 14. Uh, we've been there uh, working our way through the Exodus. And as I said last week, we did the first part of this chapter last week. And I hope you know we're at a very high place, not just in the book of Exodus, but really in all of the scriptures. Um, the Exodus, the parting of the Red Sea, and as the title in your bulletin says, the Lord saving his people um, is one of, if not the most well-known places in scripture that this story. In fact, if you were um, in a big crowd in almost any setting and you said, I would like to part the Red Sea right here, People would know what you're referring to and they would know what you mean is we're dividing something on the left um, and on the right. And as far as the Bible goes, it is an event in the life of God's people that it reminds us of over and over and over. In fact, our call to worship, I referred you to, to Psalm 77, um, tells us how to use something like the Exodus. If I, we won't turn there, but if you turned to Psalm 77, the first half of that uses the word I over and over. I will remember, I know that God did this, I know that God acted on behalf of his people, and then it shifts to you, O Lord, and there's a shift in, here's what God has done, and so I expect that God has done that and will continue to do that. That's kind of how the Exodus works, is it's a picture of what God has done eternally. It's an earthly way in which God acted in mighty power to save his people from an earthly enemy, but it points us to a spiritual reality that Jesus' own son, like Moses, was sent as a mediator between God and his people, fought a battle and saved his people from sin and death. And oh, by the way, from slavery to sin is what the New Testament um, tells us about. So this um, uh, spectacular picture um, from a very old movie um, reminds us that God did no ordinary thing. In fact, um, it's so extraordinary, it's beyond belief for some people. In fact, there's a, 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 a place in which some people almost hesitate to tell something like this. In fact, there was a little boy, eight or nine years old, came home from school. You may have heard this story. It's a well-known one. Whether it happened or not, it's a, it's a, a good preacher story, as I say. But he came home and his mom said, what did you learn in Bible school today? And he said, we learned about the people of God being saved by crossing the Red Sea. And she said, well, son, how did that happen? And he said, well, the Egyptian army came up on the Israelites, and right as they were ready to swoop down and, and destroy the Israelites, the Israeli Air Force re, uh, came sweeping over and strafed the Egyptians, and the Israeli engineers threw down pontoon bridges over the Red Sea, and the Israeli army led the children of Israel across the Red Sea. And his mom, knowing the story, said, is that what they told you happened? And he said, well, no, mom, but if I told you what they said happened, you would never believe what they told me. And as I have reminded you often, I think already here in Exodus, um, I'm not sure why when we come to some of the things in the Bible like this, um, in fact, lots of commentaries and books and things you'll open up, and they'll try to describe in natural ways how this could have happened. That if the wind blew just right and they were at just the right place on the Red Sea or maybe some of the lakes just north of there, that the water could have gotten shallow enough and they walked across. And I always am reminded of, I'm not sure why we have a tendency to want to not believe that God couldn't have done something as miraculous as it looks like he did in this picture. Because it's what the Bible says happened. And if you were reading your Bible, I don't know how you get past the first verse and then can't believe anything that happened after that. When the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth, then if he did that, and I believe he did, what could possibly happen in and among those people on the earth that God couldn't do if he created it all? And so... In this place, we see very clearly the mighty power of God at work, not just in some random demonstration of power, but God acting 
according to his promises in saving his people from an enemy. And I want you to know too that what we are ultimately pointing to here is that God acting in an extraordinary way by the birth of his son, fully man and fully God, living a perfect life, suffering on the cross for our sins, dying and being resurrected on the third day. God was stretching out his mighty hand and he was saving you from a spiritual kind of slavery and death because of our sin. And so, um, last week, um, we read about in the first half of this chapter, God's people were in a desperate situation. God had led them to where they were trapped between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. And it seemed sure and certain that this was going to be the end, even though God had led them there. So let's read the rest of this chapter, starting with verse 19. This is the word of the Lord. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, Earlier we read that this is what God had told him to do. And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and the cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians." The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Then thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. May God bless his word for us today. I want to look at kind of three phases of this story, and really this is uh, what we're going to see here today is what God has been doing all along for his people. Um, And it starts with guarding and guiding, or guiding and guarding his people, even when it looked as if the people were on their own and in great uh, mortal danger, we find that God has still been guiding and guarding them. And we see that God demonstrates his power by throwing the Egyptians into panic. So along with guarding and guiding them, it is God's power and the panic of his enemies um, comes forth to us. And finally, God's glory and grace. We concentrated on that glory last week. We read that two different times in the first part of this chapter, God says, I will get glory over Pharaoh. He's going to let not only Pharaoh, his army, and all of Egypt, but really all the world will know that God is great and Pharaoh is not. But he's also going to show that he's gracious to his people. If you remember um, where we left off last week, uh, the people of God are grumbling and complaining. Remember they said, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to now die? And so in God's grace, we're going to see even in spite of their temporary lack of faith that God is still saving his people according to his 
promises. So there's some great pieces of art over the centuries regarding what takes place here. Um, here's one of them is how do we picture this pillar of fire and cloud before the people? But what's interesting in this story, and I know it's kind of clumsy the way the text put it there in those first couple of verses in, in verses 19 and 20 because it's really hard to translate. Something happened there that this pillar of cloud and fire that had been guiding them since they came out of Egypt, it was a cloud by day and fire by night, um, it says was leading them. But when they come to the Red Sea, then the angel of the Lord and subsequently this pillar of cloud and fire now goes behind them. So it's now between Israel and Egypt, between God's people and God's enemy. And that's why we say he was guiding and guarding them. God had led them to this, and by human terms, dead end. Remember last week we compared it to that uh, uh, great place in history and the movies were made about Dunkirk where the Allied soldiers got trapped on the beach and had to be saved by boats. But we knew here no boats were coming to save these people. The enemy was about to press in upon them. But who intercedes? Who intervenes between the threat to God's people and his people? God himself in the form of this cloud, in the form of an angel there, now separates God's people from certain death. This pillar of cloud and this angel stands between God's people and their certain demise. And so uh, it's interesting too that it's given light on the Israel side and darkness on the Egyptian side. In fact, there's a separation that's unmistakable here. Light versus dark, curse versus blessing, judgment versus grace, and ultimately death versus life. This episode in the history of God's people, this uh, episode in the history of the world demonstrates a spiritual reality that has always been true and continues to be true. From the time that Adam and Eve left the garden, there was a separation between the people of God and those that are enemies of God. And it's always been that way. And the difference in being part of the people of God and the enemy of God is not just light and darkness. It's not just curse and blessing, but it's judgment and it's grace and it's literally life and death. We have a picture of salvation here that some will be saved and some will not. And those that God has chosen for his own and act in obedience to him, although not perfect obedience, but it's God's mighty hand that does the saving. And we'll notice over and over, it's not because they deserved it, it's because God has set his special love upon these people. The New Testament tells us of this reality of separating life and death. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. Notice God gave it, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. And so there's a separation between those who have trusted God for their salvation and those who haven't and thus remain the enemies of God and under his eternal judgment. And so at the very beginning, it is at least this, that there is this guiding and guarding of God's people that separates them from the danger to them. But there's a reality is that we have to be among those who call upon the name of the Lord. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Secondly, this power and this panic. And maybe this is um, just an awesome display. Again, this work of art, I, I, I like this one especially because it shows Moses in obedience holding his staff out over there, but it's not Moses and it's not that staff that can divide a whole entire sea in this way. And you can imagine, actually this is not a very accurate picture because the, the text told us that it took an east wind blowing all night. God did some instantaneous, uh, amazing, miraculous miracles throughout what was recorded in the scriptures, but this wasn't staff goes out and boom, water divides. 
Um, the people of God, including Moses, had to wait all night long for these waters to slowly divide. But remembering, there's an angel of the Lord and this pillar of fire behind them. And so this great, I like this because of the bright light shining upon what God has done and only darkness um, for the enemies of God. And I like, again, because people want to say, well, this east wind blew all night. And they'll say, well, there's certain places on the Red Sea where it's shallow enough that when the wind blew, it could cause the tide to go such in a direction that maybe only a few inches of water could be there and the people walked across. Well, that's not what it says, even if that were true. In fact, did you catch two different times it says they walked between walls of water. And that word for walls isn't just separating, it means high fortifications. And there's, again, a, a story that's told about these walls of water that a lot of people say, well, that probably didn't happen. We could explain this by the winds blowing the tide and all this kind of thing. Well, a preacher was visiting a church, and as he talked about crossing the Red Sea, someone shouted from the congregation, praise the Lord, taking all them children through the deep waters. What a mighty miracle. And this minister who didn't believe in those kinds of miracles was annoyed by this uh, intervention by one of the parishioners. So rather condescendingly, he told the congregation that the Israelites were probably in a marshland with an ebbing tide, so they were simply wading through six inches of water. And in response, the same voice came from the back. Praise the Lord, drowning all them Egyptians in six inches of water. What a mighty miracle. One way or the other, God did a miracle here. And I'm one of those who believe if God did a miracle, why don't we take it at face value and let it be what the Bible says that it was. Now if you want to doubt, doubt all the miraculous, you fall in line with a lot of really famous people. In fact, I showed you a picture one time. Uh, Thomas Jefferson um, had a well-known Bible in which he took a, the full version of the Bible and literally took a pen knife and cut out all the places that he didn't think really happened, including all the miracles. In fact, in the Gospels, Thomas Jefferson's Bible ends with Jesus being put in the tomb. He literally cut out everything that came after that because he didn't believe God did miracles, not then and not now. The Bible shakes its fist at that kind of skepticism about what God can do and what God did do. And I would say, I've not seen waters parted on the left and the right, and I've walked through on dry land, but I've seen God do unbelievably miraculous things. I've seen lives changed and people healed, um, and it is evident to me that the Lord is alive and well in the world today. And however he chooses to do it, he does it. And the point of Exodus is not how he did it. In fact, I think God does miracles often in a way that we don't understand and won't understand because he wants us to know that he is God and I am not. In fact, some people have famously said, I don't want to believe in a God that I can completely understand because doesn't that take away some of his deity if I really know all there is to know about God? So praise the Lord for dividing the waters into walls and God's people walking on dry land. And in a minute we'll see also that the same act of mercy also creates judgment on the enemies of God. There's one point I want to make, um, and it's timely, that if these people went through the waters, notice how the Apostle Paul uses this picture about going through the water. This is in 1 Corinthians. Again, he's writing to a church that's having a really hard time, and he says this, I, want you, I, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors, he's talking about these people, were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. And he's saying, we are part of the lineage of people who God acted mightily in their salvation by guarding and guiding them and by saving them, by letting them go through on dry land. They were all, and they use this word in this timely for us today, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
Baptism is a sign of salvation. The Apostle Paul wants you and I to know. He wanted the Corinthian church to know, but he wants you and I to know today that God has acted in a way that we are able to look back on this miraculous way he has saved us. And we participated in that sign today. When Sarah came and professed her faith in Jesus Christ, she's proclaiming a miracle that someone who once was blind now can see. Somebody who once was dead is now alive. The water didn't do that. God did that. But the water is a sign, is a reminder of what God has done. And so let the waters both of the Red Sea and of your baptism remind you that you also were guarded and guided by God himself. You were saved by the mighty hand of God. And so what happened um, to Israel at the Red Sea, one person says, happened to us. They passed through the waters of death and came out to freedom. On the western side of the Red Sea, they were runaway slaves. On the eastern side, they were liberated people. You passed from life to death. You passed from slavery to freedom in Jesus Christ. You too have walked on dry land. And let's not forget too that the picture continues with this. This one's a little harder to see, but those are the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Did you catch that our text said Israel went into the midst of the sea, but they did so on dry land. And when the Egyptians tried to follow, God did a really amazing thing there. It says that he threw them into panic. God often does that with his enemies. In fact, last week, uh, Steve shared with us about that episode of Gideon where those 300 people, when they exposed the lamps, God threw them all into panic and they did away with themselves was the way in which God did that. In this case, not only were they in a panic, but it says that their wheels got clogged and they drove heavily. They were really stuck. In fact, some people say the translation of that, the wheels fell off of their chariots. That would make a chariot drive really heavily without the wheels on it. Whatever he did, God did it. Um, And again, if it was in six inches of water, they all drowned somehow and all that, but I choose to believe the picture was more like this, that those walls of water swallowed them up. In fact, it says that God threw them into the midst of the sea. Now, I don't doubt that they drove themselves into that, but what Exodus, what Moses wants you to know is they went into the sea because God put them there. He was also guiding them to their destruction and their judgment. They had been given over as enemies of God. But then something really miraculous happens that maybe is equally as miraculous or equally as uh, important for us to note is the first people in this story to acknowledge what God is doing is Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Did you catch that? The first words of praise come from the Egyptians. It says, let us flee. This was verse 25. Let us flee from before Israel for the Lord, that's that word Yahweh, is fighting for them against the Egyptians. The the Egyptians in this terrible moment realize they have made a huge mistake by not trusting, not knowing God and not being obedient to them. Remember, they were given over and over and over the chances. Moses came and says, Yahweh, the God of Israel, says to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know who that is. I don't know him. Why would I do that? Ten times, let my people go. No, maybe, tomorrow, later, whatever the response is, is never in obedience. And finally now, when it's too late, when the wrath and judgment of God has now come upon them, it's now and only now that he acknowledges, oh, God said, let my people go. And now he's experiencing what the Bible tells us in Philippians, every single person on heaven and in earth will experience one day that every knee will bow, Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's both the enemies of God and the people of God. The people of God will sing the praises of God because he is Lord. The enemies of God will tragically profess that as part of their judgment. 
And so God's saving of his people also accomplishes the putting forth of the judgment of a holy God against those who have opposed him. And then finally, the glory and the grace. Verse 28 says of the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. I'll remind you again, verse 27 said the Lord threw them in the midst of the sea. And verse 30 sums this all up by saying the Lord saved Israel. The Lord saved Israel. Why did he do that? Because he had chosen them to be his own, because he had set his love upon them, and he had promised that he would do just that. He had said, I will fight for you. I will get glory over Pharaoh that not only you, but they will know that there is a God in heaven, and our obedience is due to him. Our faith is due to that God. But then there's an interesting thing that I've alluded to already. It says, And Israel saw the great power of the Lord. In fact, verse 30 said that Israel had been saved from the hand of the Egyptians. And actually when it says the great power of God, it literally says the great hand that God used saved them. Moses wants you to know there's a hand of power by earthly terms. And by earthly standards, Pharaoh had a strong hand. He was one of the world powers at the time. He was able to enslave um, probably a million or two million people and keep them under his thumb. 430 years the people of God sat under this rule of Egypt. But that strong hand of Pharaoh is no match for the mighty hand of God. Let's apply that in our salvation lives. Some of you feel like you are held down by a strong hand. Maybe it's physical things. Maybe it's spiritual things in your life. Lots of us feel held down that we're in the grip of something strong that will never let go. Exodus says to us that the mighty hand of God is always stronger. That whatever grips you in this moment will one day also have to confess that there is a God in Israel, that God works for the salvation of his people. And so when we talk about God saving his people, this is from a children's Bible that simply says this, here's what God wants you to know. I am the Lord, the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. Now, you may not be an Israelite. You may not have been present in Egypt um, some 3,500 years ago, but you too have been brought out of the land of Egypt. You have been set free from slavery, and you have been done so by Jesus Christ himself. And so you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you surely have seen the power of God. And if you've not trusted in Jesus Christ, open your eyes. And I pray that today the Holy Spirit will open the eyes of your heart that you will indeed see that there is a great God in this universe, the creator of all things, but also the sustainer and the savior of all. And so do you see God's glory and God's grace here in this story, but do you see it here today? He is mighty in defeating the enemy, and he's gracious in doing it for a people before they fully realize it. I hope your testimony is that. When I first came to Christ, I had no idea of all that God is. I had no idea of the glory, the love, and the grace of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I knew some of it on that day. But he wasn't waiting for me to know him fully. He was already doing it for us. The people are already on the other side of the sea before it says that they feared the Lord and they believed in him. That's God's grace. He's not waiting for you to figure it all out. He is demonstrating his power and his glory so that you will believe in him. The offer of salvation is there for you today. Here's what 1 Peter again sums some of this up for us. Humble yourselves, Peter says, therefore under the mighty hand of God so that all at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him. Listen to this, because he cares for you. 
That's the good news of the gospel today. We, not, we don't need to work ourselves up into the good graces of God. If you don't believe in full of God today, trust him to the place he's brought you today and he will demonstrate over and over the glory and the power of his mighty hand. And he will guard and guide you along the way, casting all your anxieties on him because he does care for you. That's God's grace. That's God's love. It's always been the salvation that God has accomplished for you. Let's give thanks for that. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your love and grace to us. We're thankful that um, what you have done for these people all those many years ago is a picture of what you've done in each of our lives, that you have defeated an enemy in Satan. You've redeemed us out of the slavery of sin, and you've brought us um, from death to life into freedom and new life in Jesus Christ. We've seen that pictured in baptism today. We've sung about your grace, and we've heard from your word today that you are the God who saves. I pray that we would trust you for that today, either again and again, or maybe even for the first time, that we would give ourselves in faith to you. And we pray these things today in Jesus Christ. Amen.